Welcome back to part 3 of this video series on algorithms and algorithm analysis. In this part we introduce a five-step process for formally analyzing algorithms. Though algorithm analysis techniques may vary, an easy to follow method is the five-step process. This allows you to break the analysis down into clear steps that ensures that you don't miss anything important. The first step is to identify the input. The second step is to identify the size of the input. Next, you identify an elementary operation that you want to analyze the algorithm with respect to. The fourth step is to analyze the algorithm to determine how many times the elementary operation is performed with respect to the input size. Finally, you characterize this using asymptotic analysis. In this video, we'll cover each of the first four steps in detail, saving the fifth and final step for a subsequent video, as it's a major topic in and of itself. The first step is relatively easy. Identifying the input is trivial if you've written good pseudocode. However, there are some corner cases that you may have to deal with. In particular, if an algorithm has multiple inputs, say two collections or two numbers, do we count both? In general, we want to simplify our analysis. In the case where there are multiple dissimilar inputs, we will choose to focus on the most appropriate to the algorithm. In the case where there are multiple similar inputs, we'll focus on the larger one. To illustrate these two corner cases, consider the example of linear search. Here we have two inputs, a collection of elements and a single key. The linear search algorithm iterates over the collection, searching for a particular element that matches the key. In this case, it would be more appropriate to consider the collection as the input and ignore the single key. It is larger and the algorithm's behavior will be more affected by the size of the collection and not the key itself. Another example would be Euclid's GCD algorithm. Here there are two inputs, but they're the same type of input, two integers. Without loss of generality, we can simplify the analysis by analyzing the algorithm with respect to the larger of the two inputs. To see why this is, suppose that we have two inputs of sizes n and m, respectively. Further, suppose that b is the larger of the two. Then necessarily, the size is also larger then the total input size can be bounded by twice the largest. Ultimately, when we get to step five and provide an asymptotic analysis, we'll ignore constants like this. So without loss of generality, we can focus on the larger of the inputs. The second step also seems easy, but like the first, there are several corner cases that you need to understand. In general, we want to express the input size as a single variable, usually n. This is because we want to establish some resource function, t sub n, for time, for example. This will eventually allow us to characterize how an algorithm behaves as n grows larger and larger. That is, as we run the algorithm on larger and larger inputs. Here are some examples. If the input is a collection, then the natural input size is the size or cardinality of the collection. If the input is a graph, we could count the number of vertices or edges in it. For strings, their length is a natural size measure. For files or images, the number of bytes or pixels may be appropriate. For numbers, such as in Euclid's GCD algorithm, the input size is actually the logarithm of the number. That is the number of bits that are required to represent n in memory. For more details on why this is, we've provided a supplementary video. In the third step, we want to capture some notion of work that an algorithm performs. Again, to simplify the analysis, we choose a single elementary operation that the algorithm performs. In general, we will choose the most common or expensive or the operation most relevant to a particular analysis. An algorithm may perform many different operations, but we only want to focus on one. An algorithm may perform many different operations, but we only want to focus on one. Considering alternative elementary operations is possible and may lead to different but still correct analysis. However, operations that are necessary to the control structure of the algorithm are not generally counted. Some common elementary operations in algorithms that you've seen before include comparisons or basic arithmetic operations such as additions and multiplications. For graphs or linked lists, a node or vertex traversal can be considered an elementary operation. The second to last step is to analyze how many times the elementary operation chosen in step three is executed with respect to the input size identified in step two. Our goal here is to derive a resource function f that maps an input size to a resource measure. For our purposes, the mapping maps non-negative integers to positive reals. This may involve setting up and solving a series of summations, or it may require a deeper analysis. In general, however, 
we will consider a worst case analysis because we're interested in an upper bound on the amount of resources an algorithm will consume in its execution. To reiterate, we'll hold off on step five for the next video. For now, let's look at a few examples of a full analysis. Here's the linear search algorithm again. Step one, we identify the input, which is a collection, ignoring the single key. Step two, the size is the cardinality of the collection, also identified in the pseudocode's input. The most appropriate elementary operation in the algorithm is the comparison on line two. The number of times that a comparison on line two is executed is actually variable and depends not only on the input size, but the nature of the input as well. We could consider a best case scenario where we get lucky and find a match at the first element. In such a case, we would end up only performing one comparison and ending the algorithm. However, we're more interested in the worst case scenario in which we find a match at the last element or don't find it at all. In either case, we would compare the key to each and every element resulting in n comparisons. You can also do an average case analysis on this algorithm. A full average case analysis would require defining a probability distribution on successful searches, which we'll omit here. A naive way of looking at it is to take the average of the best and the worst case, in which you still get approximately n divided by two comparisons, which is similar to what a more formal analysis would give you. In both the worst and average case, however, we would still get a linear function, thus the name of the algorithm. Here's another example, computing the symmetric difference of two sets. The symmetric difference is defined as all elements that are in one set, but not in the other, and vice versa. As with the previous example, there are two inputs, but they're both collections. So without loss of generality, we'll assume that A is the larger of the two sets. This allows us to easily state that the input size is the size of A, with n elements. The elementary operation in this algorithm is testing the set membership of an element, performed on lines 3 and 6. To analyze how many times these are performed, we observe that the first loop runs n times, and the second loop runs m times. Thus the total is n plus m, but since we made the assumption that n is larger, we can place a worst case upper bound on the number of elementary operations at 2n. Our final example is a familiar algorithm, selection sort. The first two steps are straightforward. The input is the collection, and its size is n. We could analyze this algorithm with respect to the number of swaps on line 6, and that would be a perfectly valid analysis. For this example, however, let's stick with the comparison on line 4. To reiterate a point from before, we observe that the algorithm is performing other operations as well. In the loops on lines 1 and 3, it's performing some additions as well as some comparisons to determine if the loop should continue execution. However, it would not be appropriate to analyze this algorithm with respect to either of those operations. They're both necessary to the control structures of the algorithm. In any case, the control structure operations would be implicitly counted in our final analysis. To determine how many comparisons are made here, we're going to need to derive and solve a basic summation. We'll look from line 4 outward. On line 4, we perform a single comparison. Observing the enclosing loop structure, line 4 is executed once for each iteration. The inner loop executes once for each value of our index variable j, running from i plus 1 up to and including n. This gives us our first summation. The block of code from lines 3 through 5 is executed once for every execution of the for loop on line 1. This gives us a nested summation where i runs from 1 up to n minus 1. Now we solve this summation. The inner summation is simply 1 plus 1 plus 1 n minus i times. The summation of sums is equal to the sum of summations, so we can break this up into two summations. The first summation is easy. It's simply n plus n plus n, n minus 1 times. The second summation can be solved by applying Gauss's formula, which gives us this closed form. The second term is half the first, so it simplifies to n times n minus 1 over 2. In contrast to the two other examples, this function is quadratic. In the next video, we'll focus on step 5 and provide an asymptotic characterization of these functions.